I'm Kate Graham, and uh, I'm currently playing Diane in the London production of Come From Away, which is my great pleasure. I love being in the show. Uh, prior to that, I've done lots of shows. I've just been a, a jobbing, mostly musical theatre actor for the whole of my career since I left college in 97, showing my age. <laughs> Kate, when did you first hear about Come From Away? I first heard about it um, because a friend of mine, Kirsty Malpass, was in the original London production. And I just worked with her on Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and I knew she was going into it. So um, she was the standby and she covered Beverly Bass. So I went along to see her playing Beverly Bass. And that was the first, I mean, I knew about the show, but that was the reason why I first went along to see it, to see Kirsty, and she was fantastic. What did you think when you heard that there's a musical about 9-11? Well, because I heard about it from Kirsty, I never heard about it like that. She said, it's about the planes on 9-11, but it's not about 9-11. <laughs> she was very specific when she was telling me what it was about. So I never sort of heard, oh, there's a musical about 9-11. So that didn't really apply to me. But one of my favourite bits in the documentary is when they're talking about making a musical. Of, <laughs> is it Claude? I can't remember if it's Claude. Somebody in the documentary says, are you going to make a musical about sandwiches? <laughs> it's, like one of the, it's the most gander thing anybody says in the whole thing. It's lovely. What do you remember about your auditions? My auditions? Uh, do you know what? It was actually really pleasurable. Our creative team are like the nicest people in showbiz. So there was no real pressure. I was sent a load of material to learn and I learned it and I turned up and I sang it and then I turned up and I sang it again and then I think I did a dance call and then I had to turn up and sing it again and that was the end of it and every time I went in everybody was lovely and I think just the nature of the show even in the room outside everybody knew each other it was all of the you know sort of slightly slightly older character actors of the West End and it was just like a great big coffee morning outside we were all just having a chat so even the people that were all up for it together it didn't really matter we were all just like oh well somebody's gonna get this nice job that's good so there was just a general feeling of warmth about the whole process I actually really enjoyed it what helps you to switch accents oh I well we have an amazing dialect coach Joel Golden so I don't know if you've spoken to him but he is his ear is like you can't get away with anything so he's really helpful he goes through everything sort of phonetically and says no you need to make this sound in this word you need to make this sound and um so basically that you just learn it and uh, periodically he'll listen to us doing the show and send through a script with sort of all the bits you got wrong <laughs> all the bits that weren't quite the right sound let's say not got wrong but yeah so you know and then you have to just record yourself i find it really useful to record myself saying it to see if what i'm aiming for is actually what i'm achieving because sometimes you think you're saying it in a certain way and when you hear yourself you're not so it's really useful to record yourself and listen back but yeah it's just drilling it really is just drilling well, let's talk about uh, choreography well i'm gonna say this is a slightly controversial thing to say but diane's track doesn't have as much chairography as somebody like Bonnie. Bonnie has to move all the chairs all the time. She's literally in every transition. We call them transitions when we move the stage around from one scene to another. And in every transition, Mary Doty is flying around the stage, moving five chairs and picking up three coats and sitting somebody down there and picking that up. And, and actually, I don't have that many difficult ones to do. Mine are OK. They're fast. You know, you have to know what you're doing, but it, they're not as tricky as Mary's. So I was quite glad. Did you name the chairs? Yeah, the chairs all have numbers. And in rehearsal, they have, we, they have giant bits of paper with the numbers stuck on the back. So if you go, I know I'm going to chair four, there it is, you can see it. And then like one day we just went in and they'd taken all the numbers off because they don't have the numbers on them on stage. And we're like, I don't know which chair is which. But all the chairs are different. So you just have to sort of give them little personalities like number eight is just a it's a plain brown ladder back chair but it has some green paint on it so i always used to think after eights the chocolates i don't know whether you have those but they're like mint flavored chocolates so that's how i remember that that one with a bit of green on is number eight it's just, you give yourself the craziest ways to remember it but once it's in it's in 
Is it scary to walk on uh, these chairs during the Stop the World uh, scene? <laughs> not, not when the lights are on, but as soon as the lighting state that is in there happens, you actually can't see anything beyond the chairs. So it just looks like there's this sort of giant abyss in front of you and everything is black. So you have no real sense of where the floor is anymore. So it can be a little bit disorientating. Um, and in that respect, it's scary. But if we're just doing it in rehearsal, say, and we're walking on them and it's moving around, it's really, it's really safe. They make sure it's really safe. But yeah, the lighting state does something to it, which makes it a bit more scary than it is in rehearsal. But once you get used to it, it's fine. I've given myself little bits where I clock where the proscenium arch is just so that I know where I am and then, and then I carry on. But yeah, it is a process. It's more frightening than you would think, actually. Especially with a turntable. Yeah, although it's not very fast, you know, it's quite slow. <laughs> and also I really, I mean, come from a way is unique in its fact that it's a, such a true ensemble piece and we all really trust each other. So for example, Jenna Boyd, who plays Beulah, if there's something wrong with the chair, she will just touch the side of my leg so that I know to stop walking. And I know that she'll do that. And I trust that she's going to do that. So I know that I'm safe because I know that we're all taking care of each other at the same time. So it's not too bad. Kate, what do you remember about your first Camp Broadway performance? <gasps> the first one? Well, that was pandemic. I don't remember a lot apart from I knew that like, <laughs> the, about half the company left and half the company joined when we did the takeover of the roles and the company that were con the continuing company were incre like incredibly welcoming because they're all delightful um but they were just sort of reasonably calm and chatting to each other and every single one of the new company was like this really really concentrating really really high adrenaline really sort of on the edge of our nerves just to make sure that we got everything right um I just remember that, but post pandemic, the first show back where we all rehearsed together as a unit and we were coming back as the first company back after the um, the closure. I will never forget that. I will never forget that night because we, we were all sort of prepared. We all thought, right, we know what we're doing. And then we walked onto the stage and the whole auditorium just stood, <laughs> stood up and clapped. And it was like, and then you suddenly become really emotional and then you have to try to concentrate through that. Um, but the atmosphere in the theatre that night was just electric. It was a really, really beautiful thing to be a part of. It was gorgeous. Can you tell me a little about uh, the pandemic? Like when did you first hear about the closure and how did you react? Well, I suppose we were aware that there was something going on and I think I just it was all so piecemeal the information that was coming through and even on the Monday when we actually did close we were in work ready to go and then we sort of got a message saying oh um one of the other shows down the road is cancelled tonight and um and then the producers were our warm-up we were all ready to go we had our makeup on and everything you know and they said we're gonna have to close but you know at that point it was going to be for two weeks maybe four weeks so, you know, just go home and then we'll come back and and then slowly information drip feeds in and it just goes on and on and on. And I I think it was better that it was like that in a way, because if they'd said to us on that day, we're going to close for a year and a bit, it would have been horrific. So we went back at some point in the summer to get things out of our dressing rooms and it was just like. Marie Celeste you know it was like everything my shoes were still where I'd taken them off my makeup brushes were still out where I'd been putting my makeup on there was a half empty mug of tea on my bed you know it's just like everything had just been dropped and we just had to go so actually we didn't just go we all went and got champagne from our dressing rooms and drank it on the stage together and then we went but um yeah it was a sort of very slowly evolving thing where nobody was quite sure what was going to happen so I don't remember the stages of it particularly. I just remember that day being told that we were going to be closed possibly for four weeks at the most. And then, and then we were just closed <laughs> forever. How did you find out about the reopening? Who told you about that? 
uh the producers were we were all in contact with each other the whole time so we would have like a monthly zoom maybe we had a couple of quizzes and stuff so we were all constantly in contact and we there were dates sort of banded around um and then the final confirmation came through i think about four weeks before rehearsals were due to start but we knew that it was going to be in the summer at some point what did it feel like to stand in front of a live audience again after such a long time oh it was it was all the feelings all at once all the the fear because we hadn't done it for so long the excitement because we were just dying to get back out there and do it the just the the overwhelming sense of everything that everybody had been through, the audience had been through, we'd been through, and we were finally coming back together and the sense of communal experience that we just hadn't had for so long. And the music is so evocative and so emotional. And it was just everything that we'd waited for, for such a long time, the audience included. And uh, it was joyful and emotional. And what was it like to perform on the 20th anniversary of 9-11? Ah, we had two shows that day. And um, obviously some of the company had um, performed on a 9-11 anniversary before. So we had some idea that it might be sort of slightly more subdued than normal or, or more anything. You know, you get people come to the show who have lost people or plane passengers come to the show. and. Um, we just were sort of slightly not really knowing what to expect, but actually it was it was another riotous day. There was a sort of sense of real celebration that something good was being celebrated about that date instead of something bad. And it was really lovely. What's in your opinion uh, the main message of Come From Away and why does it resonate with so many people all over the world? Oh. I, there are so many messages in Come From Away, and they're all good. I, for me, it, it's kind. It really is about kindness um, to ourselves, to other people, and a sense that we all have a collective responsibility to look after each other. And we forget that sometimes now, because we're all in our unique little bubbles, and we have our world in our hand on our smartphone and we can isolate ourselves and we can only come into contact with the people who directly matter to us like our family and our friends but actually to belong to a sense of a wider community where you're taking care of people you don't actually you might not actually know that well or have no vested interest in but we have this collective responsibility to look after each other and take care of each other i think that is something that we all probably have had experience of belonging to at some point in our lives if we're lucky enough to have been at a, a really nice school or belong to a really nice community growing up. And I just think we all know that that's good and we all want to do that, but sometimes we forget. So Come From Away sort of reminds us of the best bits of ourselves, really, I think. Did you get to meet any of the real life people? Not that many, because obviously we were just opening pre-pandemic and there was a, um, a limit on flying but we did meet brian Mosher and um bonnie uh i think that was yeah i think that was it um and i'm really hoping to skype at least with nick and diane at some point if alistair and i can get together and skype them together that would be great um but yeah i'm also hoping they might come over at some point once everything calms down a bit i'd love i'd really love to meet them nick and diane are lovely Actually, I met them at the Phoenix Theater. Ah, uh, did you? Yeah. They're amazing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just I just think they're delightful. Lovely, lovely people. So, fingers crossed I'll get to meet them one day. Uh, Kate, some kind of way actors mention the harsh intensity. What's that? I've never heard that phrase before. I don't know. <laughs> OK. It's, uh, it was someone from the Broadway company. I think they meant that they have to sing quietly, but very, I don't know, intense kind of singing. Oh, know. yeah, there is a lot of that. Yeah, I, the singing is, um, the singing in the show is much more like a sound effect sometimes. So that when we slip from the this actual people speaking and singing 
as if they were speaking into the kind of, uh, for example, in the opening number where it goes into the, you are here, that bit where it suddenly goes otherworldly and the sound becomes kind of breathy, but intense. So yeah, it is that. It's actually quite difficult to do as a unit when you're not right next to each other. When we rehearse it and we're all standing really close, it's, we can hear what it sounds like and we can hear each other. So then you just have to take the muscle memory of what that felt like and do it on stage and trust that everybody else is doing the same thing as well because we can't really hear each other when we're doing that on stage. Which song always gets stuck in your head after the show? <laughs> oh, which one? Oh, this is so many, it depends on different days, but I always end up singing the end bit after, um, but as they boarded, the started to rain. That beautiful note that Mary sings is just so beautiful. And then Jenna coming in on top with, at the end of the day, after everyone left. It's just the most beautiful moment in the show, I think. I love that bit. So I frequently sing that bit, even though it's just a tiny little bit. It's beautiful. I love it too. Yeah, it's really effective. What did you struggle with the most when you rehearsed? Ooh, mm. the, probably the sense of, because so much happens to Nick and Diane in between the bits where we see them on stage. So you have to really pace those bits out in your mind and know where your relationship has got to in the next scene. So for example, between the first plane and the bus scene, time has passed, they've chatted, their relationship has moved on. And you have to get yourself in that space without experiencing those bits in between. And also in between, you're most likely playing somebody else. So there might be something, you have to concentrate on something else in the meantime, and then you have to hook yourself straight back into where the relationship is at that moment in time so that the audience are clear about what has happened between them in between the times that they've seen them. So that was quite hard. And Alistair and I spent quite a bit of time talking about where they were on an intimacy level or where they were on a sort of friendship level, how well they knew each other by the time they got to Screech and how well they knew each other by the, and obviously there are things that we don't, we can take a guess at, but we don't really know. So we're just doing our, our interpretation and our version of where we think that would have happened. So. By the way, is it hard to perform without an intermission? Uh, concentration wise and not, not length of time wise, really, because an hour and 40 minutes is the same as some first halves that I've had to do. So it's just like doing half a show almost a long half a show, but yeah. Um, but concentration wise, not having any time where you're not on stage, that is, that is tricky. You have to, you can't be tired at the start of the show. You have to have a lot of physical energy to keep your concentration up, to get from the beginning to the end. What's your favorite come from way mishap? Mishap? <laughs> oh, I don't know. We haven't had that many, you know. What's happened? I did walk on in blankets and bedding once with my phone in my hand, you know, the old fashioned handsets of the phones. And I walked on. <laughs> And Jenna was going to crystallize sun and used to looking for blankets and bedding and maybe some food on my and I picked up my phone and it went boing and the end just fell off into my other hand. <laughs> I was like, hmm, okay. Shall I just carry on pretending to sing into this phone or what? But I just carried on pretending and then they repaired it. But I, that is so small. I don't know, we haven't had that many mishaps, I don't think. We've had a few switch outs where people have had to be replaced mid-show which are always really astonishingly clever, I think. I don't know how the stunt boys do it. They just come on and switch with the person they're covering and then we don't even stop. We don't even know that's happened. So yeah, it's really clever. But no real mishaps yet, touch wood. Come from away, standbys are absolutely incredible and they cover yes. so many tracks. Have no I idea how to do no it. I have no idea how they do it. I have no idea. Genuinely, I've covered before and I covered maybe two people and that, that was my brain at capacity. <laughs> so I'm just glad I don't have to do it. But they're incredible. They are incredible. I have 
heard that you have a very active and supporting Come From Work fans in London. Oh, we love the fans in London. They're amazing. And even all through lockdown and everything, everybody, they were all, they're a sense of community together as well, I think. Everybody makes friends with each other and everybody knows each other and we see them at the show and it's just so nice to see friendly faces out there and people that we know love the show. And you know what? I think the Come From Away fans, people are fans of the show because they're nice people. This is the bottom line, I think, because the show is about nice people. And they are fans of the show because they like nice people and they are nice people and they are kind and they want the world to be like this. So I just think they're the best. They're the best. Kate, is there anything you would like to talk about? No, not really. I mean, I'm just thrilled to be doing Come From Away again. It's, the, it's honestly the most wonderful show to do. It's an actor's dream. The company are wonderful. <laughs> My dog is just ripping apart a football in the background. Um, I just think it's a wonderful show and a wonderful time in history for everybody to be hearing the story. Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, to chat. Thank you so much for making time. No problem. All right. Have a lovely rest of day. Bye bye. You too. Thank you.